government. Before I call the Minister, I want to remind members that in light of social distancing being observed by parties, I have relaxed the Speaker's ruling that members must be in the Chamber to hear a statement if they want to ask a question. Members do still have to make sure that their name is on the speaking list and if they wish to be called, but they can do this by rising in their place, as well as notifying the business office or the Speaker's table directly. I remind members again to be concise in asking their questions. As this is a plenary session, we do not have the flexibility afforded by the ad hoc committee. So if members monopolise time, those further down the speaking list will not get called. So I would remind members, please, to not make speeches and to keep their questions short and focused. I call the Minister for Infrastructure, Ms Nicola Malaman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, for the opportunity to update members on the ways in which my department is contributing to the fight against COVID-19. At the outset, I want to recognise that while this is a challenging time for all of us, my thoughts are with those families who have sadly lost loved ones and those individuals who are fighting against COVID-19 on the front line. We are currently in week seven of the lockdown. Families, businesses and communities across Northern Ireland have been incredible in playing their part to save lives and protect each and every one of us from the virus. The task has not been easy. Friends and families have been torn apart, unable to share a cup of tea, a hug or even just chat on the same sofa. This isn't the life that we all know and it's not easy on any of us. This will be a lonely time for many, a challenging time, and it's important that in this place we say to people at home that it's okay not to be okay. We need to come together to help each other, support each other as we make our way through. Lockdown isn't easy. It goes against everything we know and who we are and our need for social interaction, not least with those we love. As members will be aware, this week the Executive is reviewing the regulations. Guided by the Chief Medical Officer and the Chief Scientific Advisor, we will look closely at what opportunity there is to safely ease some of the restrictions. A robust testing, tracing and tracking system across the island must be a critical component of this. We all need to work together in the fight back against COVID-19 and today I would like to take this opportunity to provide you with an update on the further action my department has taken since my statement to the Ad Hoc Committee on the 16th of April. As we remain focused on first and foremost protecting people and keeping them safe, and in doing so, minimise as much as possible disruption to our services. I am conscious that one of the areas of significant disruption for people is the provision of MOTs by the DBA. My department has worked hard to find a range of solutions for all types of vehicles, and there are now a significant number of exemptions and extensions currently in place until MOC to MOT services can be safely resumed. In addition, the new lifts are being installed on a phased basis and will be fully in place by the start of July unless the MOT centres are needed for COVID-19 testing, which I have said consistently will be the priority for as long as they are needed. The provision of temporary exemption certificates, or TECs, has been effective in keeping people on the road and ensuring vehicles can be taxed. However, some of the TECs are starting to come to an end and will need to be reviewed. In considering this issue, I have had to take into account the volume of vehicles currently impacted and the fact that COVID-19 restrictions are likely to result in a suspension of most, if not all, MOT services for some time to come. It is a simple yet challenging fact that when MOT centres reopen, there will not be the capacity to test all the cars that have missed out, along with those that need to be tested normally at that point in time. I believe it is really important to minimise the disruption as far as possible. I am therefore announcing today 
that I have decided that DVA will continue to issue TECs to those vehicles, whether they be private cars, good vehicles, trailers or motorcycles, who have already been issued one until their normal annual MOT date. This means that a vehicle will get an exemption for one year, which will bring it back into the system when there is capacity to test it. Whenever vehicle testing services are properly restored, those vehicles due their annual MOT at that time will be tested as normal and therefore will not be disrupted. These TECs will be extended to the maximum timeframes set out in legislation, but importantly, when each is ruled forward, they will provide full cover for one year from the normal MOT expiry date in 2020 until the date the vehicle is due for test in 2021. The PSNI, DVA Roadside Enforcement and the Association of British Insurers are aware of this position. It is important to remember that these are temporary arrangements and I would remind drivers that they are responsible under the law for the roadworthiness of their vehicle at all times and they should maintain their vehicles to the appropriate standard. In addition, I recognise that the current process has been difficult and confusing for customers with many queries raised about whether a TEC is in place and the time frame for refunds. Therefore, I am also announcing today that an automatic process for the issuing of TECs will apply from the 11th of May. This will significantly reduce administration for both customers and staff. Customers from the 11th of May will no longer have to book a test that they know they will never attend and pay over money only for it to be returned to them in a refund some weeks later. Instead, those vehicles that, requ that require a new TEC or require one for the first time will automatically be updated on the DVA system and on the Driver and Vehicle Licensing Agency system in Swansea so that the vehicle can be taxed. The DVA will not be issuing a hard copy of the certificate to customers. Instead, the NI Direct website will signpost customers to the DVLA website where they can check whether or not their vehicle has a current TEC. We will, of course, continue to issue TECs and provide refunds for those bookings that have already been made. Unfortunately for vehicles registered in Great Britain that have been brought and transported to Northern Ireland, it is not possible to issue an automatic TEC. These customers will need to contact the DVA for this to be done manually. And again, details of how to do this will be on NI Direct. Taxis and buses are subject to separate legislation and a different approach has been adopted. Through a change in legislation for taxis and a determination by the Department for Buses, I have ensured those vehicle licences that expire during the current emergency will be automatically renewed without the need for prior testing. I recognise that clear communication with customers is important and that needs to improve. I have asked DVA to ensure that comprehensive advice and clear guidance is made available to customers on the NI Direct website. I hope this provides some reassurance to members and your constituents during this difficult time. I was pleased to announce last week that the Department is working in partnership with the BMA and our incredible GPs to prioritise the processing of medical forms for those key workers who need them to renew their licences. Medicals are essential to ensure road safety for both the driver and other road users. However, I appreciate that for some, further specialist assessments may be needed to renew licences. With the strain on medical profession during this crisis, getting access to this specialist assessment is proving difficult for many drivers, and my department continues to work hard to find ways of addressing that. I appreciate the patience of members and the public during this crisis, and we continue to work hard to find a solution, including exploring legal options on a way forward. And I hope to be in a position to update members and affected drivers very soon. The lack of testing and indeed the suspension of other DVA services has meant a considerable loss of income for DVA whilst they continue to incur the costs of staff and other bills. If the COVID-19 suspension lasts three months, 
the DVA will lose income of £8.6 million from this issue. Indeed, I have already advised that DVA has identified estimated additional COVID-19 related pressures of up to £181 million in total. These cost estimates are based on the information available and current assumptions on the impact and duration of the crisis. The reality is that across every department, the current public health emergency requires a level of response that cannot be contained within conventional budgets or indeed conventional processes. All of these pressures arise as a result of lost income from various business areas, including Northern Ireland Water, Translink and DVA, and from sources of income such as planning fees and fares on the Strangford Ferry. At this point, I would like to highlight the particular challenges that Translink faces. The need to stay at home to save lives has clearly had very significant implications for our publicly owned public transport provider. While my department remains the only department outside of the Executive Office not to have received an allocation yet from the Department of Finance on the COVID-19 budget, I do welcome Executive colleagues' commitment to support and fund our public transport network. As we are seeing across the world, governments are recognising the crucial need to invest in infrastructure as we recover from this crisis and build our new society from it. We should be no different if we want to deliver the radical change that our communities and our environment desperately needs. On Friday, I was pleased to announce the provision of a financial support package of £5.7 million, with the costs being shared by the Executive and the British Government to support our airlines and airports. This assistance will provide financial aid to both the City of Derry Airport and Belfast City Airport to help with their operating costs when so much of their business has been affected. Finance is also being made available to keep the remaining flights operating out of both airports. While my powers in respect of airports are limited to regulation, Working with executive colleagues and the Department for Transport, I have been able to secure this unique package of support for our airports at this difficult time. It is this type of collaborative working that will get us through this crisis and ensure our recovery from it. Members will also be aware that again through collaborative work across these islands, I was able to secure our supply chains with funding of up to £17 million financed in partnership by the executive and British government to support our three ferry operators along our five critical routes. A package that will ensure that foods, goods, medicines and PPE will continue to come across to the north. I am, however, acutely aware that the haulage sector is also crucial to effective functioning supply chains. And while responsibility for this sits with the Department for Economy, I will continue to work closely with colleagues to do all that I can to help this industry in their crucial role in securing critical supply chains during this difficult time. The performance of the planning system will also have a critical role in supporting our future economic and societal recover, recovery, so we need to safely keep plans and projects moving through the system. I want to bring you up to date with some of the measures I have brought forward. Last week, I made regulations to temporarily suspend the requirement to hold a public event as part of the pre-application community consultation process for major applications. I want to assure members this is not in any way to remove the need for public consultation, which is a critical part of the planning process. It is about doing it in a different way during this crisis, in line with clear public health advice. I have therefore published practice guidance on appropriate measures to replace face-to-face -face public events. This includes online engagement and other methods including the safe distribution of leaflets, newsletters and telephone consultations where people don't have access to the internet. My chief planner has also written again to councils with further advice covering a wide range of issues including the operation of planning committees and planning decision making the role of statutory consultees, the duration of planning permissions and support for pragmatic measures to keep delivering local planning services. While we continue to do all we can to protect our communities from COVID-19, we must also seize the chance for change. 
In responding to the difficulties, we have learnt lessons. We know that less cars on the road reduces emissions. More walking and cycling means healthier bodies, healthier minds, time to talk and time to be together. We have to use what we have learned to imagine and plan for a better, greener, healthier, happier future. To that end, I have met with representatives of the business sector and green sector to start an early discussion on how my department can help to shape our recovery and what we can learn from our response to the pandemic. We all share the belief that infrastructure spending will be crucial in restarting the economy. Investing in our transport system and our water and sewage network would kick-start the construction sector and its supply chain. We also need to think about how we enable and support social distancing as we bring people back into the hearts of our towns and cities, and how we give them the confidence to make the decision to return for leisure as well as for work when the time is right. At the same time, I am very aware that this health emergency has forever changed the ways in which we live and work, and it is difficult to ascertain the impact that this will have on how we use these spaces in the future. However, in the darkness of this pandemic, we are being presented with an opportunity to reimagine these places, and it is one that I believe we should seize. In order to give a real focus to a green recovery, where we will embed more active ways of travelling in the very heart of our overall transport policy, I am delighted to announce today that I am creating a walking and cycling champion within my department. Our champion will ensure that we deliver our commitment to increase the percentage of journeys made by walking and cycling, inspiring our communities, restructuring our spaces, changing forever the way we live and changing it for the better. I want to increase the space available for people who want to walk and cycle by extending pavements, pedestrianising streets and introducing pop-up cycle lanes. I have already identified some areas in Belfast City Centre and in Derry City that can be quickly transformed, and I intend to work with councils right across the north to identify more as a matter of urgency. Transforming communities right across Northern Ireland, inspiring a new way of living in our new world of this new normal. I am clear also on the need for this work to be done on a collaborative basis, and I will also be asking the Walking and Cycling Champion to establish immediately an action-focused group of stakeholders, both within and outside government, to provide quick advice and to challenge my department and to ensure that we consider opportunities and build on the positive changes we are seeing when it comes to higher levels of walking and cycling during the current emergency. I also want us to work in collaboration with communities, including, for example, to identify and create quiet streets where pedestrians, cyclists and play have priority, and motor vehicles are guests. I am determined that we take action, particularly to address traffic issues in inner city neighbourhoods, and I want to make sure we do things with and not to local communities. We have a wealth of organisations with skills in working to help local residents develop a new vision for their areas, and I want to harness those skills to improve neighbourhoods and improve the quality of life for all of our citizens. This is not just an environmental imperative. We need to do this because it is a public health one. I shall be keeping a close eye on progress. I want to see ideas not just being talked about, but being turned into results that improve well-being for everyone. I am also looking for opportunities to weave blue infrastructure together with new cycle paths and footpaths, recognising that the better management of water in and through urban environments can reduce flood risk while also creating more attractive and environmentally friendly spaces. This may be ambitious, but there is one lesson COVID-19 has told us. This is our world and we must protect it. Building a better future that delivers more for our citizens socially and economically, delivering greener, cleaner and healthier communities. Thank you, Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister. Before we proceed to questions, the Minister, just a few housekeeping uh, notifications. Firstly, I think it was spotted last week that there was a bit of backsliding on the social distancing. So the microphones 
have some of the microphones have been removed from the chamber. So you must be directly in front of the microphone uh, and that way you'll be heard. Um, secondly, as I said at the start, because this isn't an ad hoc committee meeting, this is a plenary session of the Assembly. Questions need to be focused and sharp to ensure that everyone gets called to ask their question. And just as questions need to be sharp, answers need to be sharp as well, and I'm, I'm sure they will be. Um, the first person that I have on my list is the Chair of the Infrastructure Committee, Ms Michelle McElveen. Um, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her statement and welcome the clarity, clarity which was being given today in relation to MOTs and obviously the commitment by the Executive over the last number of days in relation to support for airports, city deals and associated infrastructure projects. There's still the outstanding matter of financial support for hauliers and taxi drivers, which isn't mentioned in the statement, and it's also disappointing that the problem with accessing medical assessments has still not been resolved. In addition to this, DVA has also introduced a fully online system for driving license renewal, and this is proving problematic for those who do not have access to the online system, and with hard copy applications being returned. Can the Minister give a clear timeline when these matters will be fully addressed? Thank you. I thank the, the member for her question. In relation to hauliers, uh, we have been working very hard across the executive. I've been working with the Minister um, for Economy and the Minister for Agriculture, and we are engaged on a very regular basis with uh, the Department for Transport and also UK Treasury. Um, we're very clear that we need to get support to our haulage industry because it has a critical role to play in securing our supply chains, and we will keep up the pressure on that. On the issue of taxis, the member will be aware that as Minister for Infrastructure and Responsibility for Regulation, I put a number of solutions in place. The one that's still outstanding is the specialised medical assessment. Um, I am exploring two potential legal options on that, um, and I do hope to be in a position to give confirmation to members, but also affected drivers, as soon as possible. Um, the challenge there is getting a solution that is legally robust, while also being mindful of the need to ensure road safety uh, for drivers and road users. Uh, on the issue of financial support to taxis, um, the member will also, I'm sure, be aware that um, the department responsible for financial support to those whose livelihoods and businesses have been very badly affected by this crisis is the Minister for Economy. I've made representations to the Minister uh, for Economy, uh, to the Minister for Finance, and also to the Minister for Communities in respect of the potential for repurposing uh, of our taxi drivers, uh, because I recognise that they have been one of the groups that have been really badly hit by this. There have been issues with DVA uh, in terms of uh, people being able to access contact. We did launch a single point of contact in terms of the set email address. Uh, what I have to do is I am mindful that there are people who are not able to access services online. I also have a duty to the safety of DVA staff, so we are working hard to see uh, can we bring workers back on a safe basis to be able to process those applications and provide services to those who don't have any access to online. Call Mr. Cattle Boylan. Thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and could I thank the Minister for her statement. And I, I do welcome the, the announcement in relation to the walking and cycle lanes, and I know I've mentioned this a number of times. But just, Minister, could you elaborate on the how we're going to realise the expansion of those cycle and, uh, and walking lanes, and also the issue of resources? Will that include physical structures like bollards? And I also see that Dublin City Council are engaging more with the public. As part of this whole process, and I welcome the champion for all of this, but I, is there any intention to expand that consultation process? Yeah, I thank the member um, for his question. You know, I agree with the member that this does present an opportunity to encourage and facilitate that modal shift that we have all, you know, been so passionate about. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, practical projects, um, if you look at Belfast, for example, the Boulder Belfast vision, uh, which was produced in um, conjunction with Belfast City Council, the Department for Infrastructure, and the Department for Communities, uh, has a number of exciting projects around pedestrianisation and have more people-centred places. I think that that's something that my department, working with communities and council, uh, could look at lifting. What I'm very much focused on at this moment is the need to identify and deliver on the ground quick and early wins. As you say, we have saw in Nassau Street in Dublin pop-up cycle lanes. We've seen in New York uh, the pedestrianisation uh, of streets um, uh, in Hackney in London, for example, the extension of, of pavements. Um, so I'm very clear that the approach for the champion is to be identifying with the stakeholders early quick wins, 
but also those that we can then build on. I was very clear in my statement that I'm a believer that things should not be done to communities, they should be done with them. And I've been engaging with Belfast Healthy Cities, for example, and with others. So I'm very clear that this has to be collaborative. Uh, we have to work with councils, uh, we have to work uh, with communities. Uh, and one of the ideas that I'm particularly attracted to is the quieter streets. And again, that would be very much led by residents. So very committed to this. On the issue of resource, it is absolutely going to be challenging. I've asked my officials, can they identify, because it's a ministerial priority, what flexibility we have. Uh, but I'm also very clear that I want to be working with other government departments. This is just not uh, an issue for the Department for Infrastructure. It's an issue for all of us. And I think if we work collaboratively, we get the right outcomes, but we also get more um, financial traction for each of our own individual departments' budgets. Call Mrs Dolores Kelly. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for a statement in which she oft, often refers to the importance of infrastructure has in enabling the economy to return to normal and to drive forward. So, uh, Minister, you will be aware of the work, particularly uh, in New Zealand, to get infrastructure projects shovel ready for when the construction industry returns to normal. I wonder, have you given any consideration to the uh, approach taken and whether or not it would be an opportunity to green infrastructure? I thank the member for her question, and she asks, she asks a very important question. Um, we have to be investing in our infrastructure. It's key to, uh, as an economic multiplier in terms of our construction industry, um, but it also provides a real opportunity. So I have been watching very closely what is happening in New Zealand, where there is a commitment there to progress shovel-ready projects um, as part of the recovery from COVID. I'm also aware that there is a movement in New Zealand to make sure that those construction projects also have a very clear environmental element to it, and it's something that I've already asked officials to try to explore. I think as an executive, we recognise the importance of investing uh, in infrastructure, um, and as right across the globe, it is being recognised as a key enabler. I, I hope that we recognise that here, and more importantly, that we act on it, that we invest in our infrastructure to create that economic effect, but also to get us to a better place in terms of tackling the climate emergency. I call Mr Roy Beggs. I do thank the Minister for her statement and the decision to further extend uh, the uh, temporary uh, uh, exemption certificates for MOTs, which has been essential and that's going to be automated shortly. But is the Minister reviewing a wide range of regulations, regulatory provision and licensing within her department? Because there are other areas which will also require addressed. I'm hearing response from those who uh, require bus operator licences at some point. That mechanism needs to be followed up. And again, those who have been driving with a one-year uh, international national driving licence in Northern Ireland and are unable to carry out the practical driving test. I recognise that this crisis has thrown up a number of difficulties, and I think that's inevitable when you run a service that is interacting with thousands and thousands of people uh, on a weekly basis, which DVA does across its range uh, of services. Um, in terms of the licensing issues, so if we take the example of, of say, taxi drivers, there was an issue around PSV extensions. We've addressed that with a six-month free of charge extension. There was an issue for our taxi drivers around access to online training. Uh, as a result of this crisis, we've increased the number of courses that are available online to do that. Um, and there, remains, um, there is an issue around medical forms by GPs, which is a requirement for some drivers for their licences. Again, we're working with the BMA to address that. The one particular issue that we haven't got completely resolved yet is for those drivers who require a further specialised medical assessment. And that situation has arose because all of our medics are focused on COVID-19. But I would hope to be in a position very, very soon to be able to pre present to members and those drivers a, a solution uh, to that. Um, I think what this has, uh, has brought home to me is that we should have been at a much more advanced stage in DVA in terms of the automated nature of, of services. And I hope the member recognises that we're trying to address that from the 11th of May in one aspect. But I'm very mindful that we need to be able to extend that across other services where it's not applicable at the moment. Mr. Andrew Muir. 
thank you very much, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her statement, particularly in relation to MOTs. I think that brings a lot of clarity to people. Um, and at the outset, I would declare I was previously an employee of TransLink. Um, the decisions that are going to be made in Northern Ireland over the next number of weeks are going to affect generations to come in terms of how we travel. And the information that's came forward recently that traffic in Northern Ireland hasn't dropped to the same level as other parts of the UK or Ireland is of real concern. And I just want to ask the, the Minister to what extent and how radical she's prepared to be in terms of the decisions going forward. For example, you've inherited a, a capital investment plan with York Street Interchange and widening of the Sydenham Bypass. Are you prepared to go ahead with the York Street Interchange in the, the current scope, or are you prepared to look at that also in relation to the Sydenham Bypass? And in relation to of travel. Uh, the purchase of bicycles is a challenge for some people. Is it something that the Department is prepared to consider in terms of a voucher scheme to allow people to uh, buy bicycles on a more discounted basis? Thank you. Members are being very creative of getting multiple questions into the one question. I admire them. Um, very quickly, on the traffic, um, we have seen uh, in recent days um, an increase in the volume of traffic on our roads. It is a concern to me. Uh, the Northern Ireland Civil Service is carrying out a piece of detailed analysis to understand why people are taking those journeys, um, and I think it's critical that we understand that and that we're informed by it. I would repeat the message that you know, only engage in travel if it is absolutely uh, essential. Um, on the issue of York Street Interchange, it is a commitment in um, New Decade, New Approach. It is a critical scheme. Um, I think just generally, as a principle, uh, given that we, have, we are going through this crisis, you know, we shouldn't be afraid of looking at, at things creatively and looking at things uh, again. Um, the same would apply, I think, for, for any of the schemes. I'm, I'm willing to look at it creatively and say, but I recognise that York Street Industry is, is a critical strategic project. Um, the bicycle, I was trying to remember. Yes, so other countries have done this. Other countries have gave a voucher which uh, you could use towards the repair of a bicycle or a purchase, something that I can feed through to the champion and to that steering group to look at. I think my challenge here is trying to have the ambition and then also being able to finance that ambition. So realistically and honestly, we're not going to be able to do everything that we want to do, but we need to be doing the things that will have the maximum effect. Thank you. I remind members that if they ask multiple questions, the Minister is only obliged to answer one of them. I call Mr Keith Buchanan. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Thank you, Minister, for statement so far. My question relates to TransLink and the difficulties they have are going under, uh, or look, the, the issues they have. The question relates to furloughing, and obviously transport London have furloughed 7,000 workers, I understand. Uh, the scheme opened on the 23rd of March. The question sort of is, have you spoke and looked about getting TransLink workers furloughed, and what would that save if that was possible to the, the budget here? Thank the member for his question. Uh, the Finance Minister did write to me uh, and make the suggestion uh, of uh, exploring the furloughing of, of TransLink sa staff. Uh, on the back of that suggestion, uh, the feasibility of that is being explored uh, by TransLink. Um, I think, for me, my view on it has been very clear, and I've made this view known to executive colleagues. Um, taking the decision to furlough public sector staff is a significant issue. It is a cross-cutting one, and it is one that we should approach um, as an executive. Um, on the issue of furloughing TransLink staff, there are a number of practical difficulties with that. The furloughing scheme ends at the end of June. Uh, we're currently you know, just a number of weeks out from that. I also have to grapple with the challenge of making sure that we have an essential public transport service for our key workers, that when we provide that, we can ensure that social distancing can be maintained. So we require additional fleet to carry uh, much limited numbers of passengers. I also need to make sure that there's a deep clean uh, so there's a number of staff that are required to ensure that we can keep that tr transport network going um, and that we can do so uh, safely. Um, I think all of that has to be taken in the round with the fact that when we are encouraging people to come back to work uh, and to do so safely, we should be encouraging them to have the confidence to be on our public transport network. And that will require that we have our public transport network in a good place and our employees ready to go into doing all of that. So I want to consider all of these things um, in the round. Call Mrs Martina Anderson. I go my August last pre camp caller and I want to thank the, the Minister for her statement. The Minister, you mentioned about the disruption to services and there was a, a question already to you about the haulage sector. I've been contacted by a number of people in the haulage sector who's deeply concerned, not just about the supply chain now 
but in a few months' time. And what they're looking to know from yourself is some indication of what kind of preparation work is underway by your department to ensure that the haulage sector is going to be ready for the full implementation of the Brexit protocol in eight months' time. I thank the member uh, for her question. Um, as the member will be aware, the lead department on this issue is the Department for Economies, but I recognise the critical importance of it, which is why I'm trying to do what I can to support her uh, and to support us as an executive. Um, at the moment, uh, I think that there is a recognition, certainly within the Department for Transport, of the critical role of our hauliers, uh, given our unique set of circumstances as an island. I think the focus at present is providing the detailed evidence the Treasury requires in order to be able to provide that financial support. So we're working with the sector very closely in order to try to get um, that detail across to evidence that case. On the issue uh, of Brexit, I think a member makes a very important point. We are all rightly focused on COVID-19, uh, but we cannot lose sight of the fact that the 31st of December is hurtling towards us, uh, which will present huge challenges in itself. When you put Brexit and COVID-19 side by side, we are going to face huge and unprecedented challenges uh, as, a, as an assembly, uh, as an economy, as a society. So we shouldn't lose sight of it in the midst of this, and preparations should continue. I call Mr Thomas Buchanan. Deputy Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for your statement to the House today. And one focused question for you is with regards to the uh, testing, where, where people, uh, obviously, people who want to do their car test has been uh, suspended for the last number of weeks, and rightly so. But has any consideration been given to those who want to do their motorcycle test? They're prepared, they're ready to do it, and obviously, the motorcycle is a one-man or one-woman vehicle, if you like, uh, with the gear that they've on them for the motorcycle. That I would indicate that it's safe enough and uh, from, a, from a virus point of view and all of that, and there's a social distance, distance aspect to it and all of that. So has any consideration been given to looking at opening up that aspect of the um, testing where someone who's ready to do their motorcycle test can get it done? Uh, thank you uh, for your question. Um, in relation to the um, driving test, um, you are right, there is a distinction between those who are taking a car test in such close proximity to the examiner. Um, and we are looking to see if there's anything we can do there. At present, we haven't been able to find a solution. Actually, nowhere across these islands has been able to find a solution to that. The member does make a very interesting point, though, around motorcycle testing. And so what I will commit to doing is going back and asking officials to specifically look at that and see if that is a, an aspect of the phased return that we could bring forward um, at an earlier opportunity. And if he is agreeable, I can pr provide that update to him in writing. Thomas Liz Kimmins. Good last brief on Cancola and thank the Minister for her statement. Um, and I also do welcome the efforts made around planning. I think it is again very important that I highlight the issue um, that's facing many um, people with planning applications that are, are planning permission that is due to expire um, during this pandemic. And I know I have raised it with the Minister on a number of occasions, but can I ask um, if the Minister has any idea of how many are, are due to um, expire or at risk of falling? Um, and also, um, how quickly could primary legislation be progressed to grant uh, extension um, to those with the plan of permission that is due to expire? Because I know it is a, a huge concern out there. I have been contacted by quite a number of agents and um, people with applications. Yeah, I thank the member for her question. She did ask about the total number of planning applications that are about to expire, and I did commit for officials to write to you. I don't know if you've received that piece of correspondence. I can chase it when I uh, go back uh, upstairs. Um, yes, this has presented an ongoing difficulty, and the member is right. Um, it does require primary legislation here uh, in Northern Ireland. We had thought as a department that perhaps the Northern Ireland Executive might have brought forward a COVID-19 uh, bill, as has happened uh, in other cases, and we would have been keen to insert this piece of legislation in that. It doesn't seem as if that's going to happen now. And so I've asked officials to explore bringing forward primary legislation. The member will understand that that does take time and it will not help those who are facing the imminent expiry of their planning permission. Um, I've also said I recognise this is not 
not ideal, but for those, the practical option facing them in the immediacy of their situation is either to, to renew, which uh, will cost a fee of one quarter of the original uh, fee, or to commence works. And I would just urge that if people are going to commence works, that they do so mindful of um, the, the case law so that any works that they can take are considered to be valid. Oh, Mr. Pat Catney. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, I note your, thank you for your statement. Uh, Minister, I note your points in relation to taxi drivers. It is clear that you are doing all that you can uh, to ensure licensing and regulations is done so quickly as possible by your department during these challenging times. However, there are still drivers out there who are struggling without any income. While this is not directly your responsibility, Minister, can you advise what your executive colleagues are doing about it? Thank the, the member for his question. I think all of us um, are, are aware of the hardship being felt by the taxi industry uh, and taxi drivers. Um, we will know them because of the role that they play in our communities, and I am sure many uh, members, family members and friends also work in the industry. Um, I have made representations to the Minister for the Economy on it, and I know that the Minister for Economy is trying to bring forward a range of financial support schemes uh, for those who have been affected. A number of schemes have been brought forward. I know that she is continuing to work on others. So I would be hopeful that um, the Executive is in a position to be able to provide financial support to those, um, those taxi drivers who you know, have had livelihoods decimated as a result of this. I have said uh, all along that I felt that there was a huge opportunity for the repurposing of taxi drivers in terms of delivering medicines um, from, from pharmacies, groceries, because we know the difficulty people are getting in terms of being able to get their food online and delivered. Um, and I have made representations to the Minister for Communities on that. I know she has been working hard to explore that. Um, and as I have said, I have made representations to the Minister for Economy as well on financial hardship. So I am doing what I can to play my part in the regulatory aspect. And I know that executive colleagues are trying to do the same, uh, given their responsibilities on this matter too. When one of the lines in your question is, while this is not directly your responsibility, it may be an indication um, that perhaps you're on the wrong track. If we could keep the questions directly related to the Minister's statement, uh, Mr Gordon Dunn. Deputy Speaker, and I too thank the Minister for her statement today and the update, and I think the provision of the test centres for the COVID-19 test, I think, has been very positive. And, uh, we appreciate the efforts that you have made there. Moving forward, uh, does the Minister recognise the need for in continued investment in our roads? If we look at the main roads uh, into Belfast, if you take the, the A2 from Bangor, with a backlog of traffic in the mornings to Hollywood, if you take the M1, I understand and have seen it, uh, the M1 is a backlog to Lisburn, if you take the M2, there is a backlog. Uh, to Molusk and beyond, and I am sure many of the members will concur with what I have said. Um, does the Minister recognise, moving forward, that it is important we get the balance right? There is a lot of push here on for, for green and for the use of bicycles, which is fine for a few weeks, months of the year locally, but for real transport, we need to get our roads moving, we need to get the throughput moving, we need to get vehicles flowing, rather than being restricted through the city centres. We need to see improved flow of our vehicles. I, I thank the member for his question, uh, uh, and he is right. M maintenance of our road network is uh, important, and the member will also be aware that there have been successive years of underinvestment as a result of cuts imposed on the department. Uh, in fact, the uh, recent Barton. Uh, report said that we needed to ensure funding of £143 million per annum on a reoccurring basis to prevent further deterioration uh, of our roads. I haven't been given an allocation anywhere near that. So it, I suppose the challenge for me is, and, and I've, I've, I know that the member is very, very passionate on the issue of doing, not in a derogatory sense, the basic things right, but about our street lighting and our roads and the importance that that is to communities. I share that. Uh, the challenge, though, is that we need to maintain existing services, and where we can, we need to be doing things in an improved and, and better way. So, I don't want the member thinking that I'm completely dismissive of the need to maintain our road network. Um, I do recognise the importance of it, but I also think we should have ambition in terms of trying to change the way that we do things, and that's why I'm also very passionate around the whole active, sustainable travel agenda. Oh, Ms. Catherine Kelly. 
Can the Minister give us assurances that frontline workers are content um, with the conditions of their workplace, um, such as those within roads maintenance, public transport and NA water, for example? Yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, so, if I take the issue of TransLink first, um, I've been very clear right across the department that uh, safety of the public and our staff is paramount. Um, in terms of TransLink, they have brought forward a number of initiatives. There are cough screens on every single uh, bus. Uh, bus drivers and train drivers have been provided with, with gloves and hand sanitizer. We have introduced a no cashback policy as well to avoid transmission. There is uh, increased cleaning um, of all of our vehicles. Um, and I want to put on record my appreciation to all of the staff in TransLink because they go to work to make sure that the rest of those who are engaged in essential work and get to and from work. On Northern Ireland Water, um, again, I've stressed the importance um, of making sure that workers are safe. Uh, and actually, I have regular uh, conference calls with the chief executive to get assurances around that. On road service and um, within our own department, um, we've been very clear that where people can work from home, they should work from home. Where the work is essential and they can't, they have to go to work um, to keep our roads safe, to prevent flooding, then we absolutely must make sure that they are kept safe through social distancing and PPE. As a department, we are very regularly engaged with the trade unions and with workers, and I request very, very regular updates on any concerns the trade unions or workers have. I've also said to members that if they are aware of individual cases where someone feels that, they, as an employee, they are not being kept safe, I absolutely want to know about it. Call Mr. Chris Little. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. As Chair of the All-Party Assembly Group on Cycling, I particularly welcome the Minister's commitment to active travel. It's a, a healthy, socially distant and fun way in which uh, for people to move. I welcome the walking and cycling champion and the Ministerial Advisory Group, and hopefully her urged early engagement with the All-Party Group on Cycling was a helpful link to the ideas and people needed to realise the potential of active travel. But she will be aware that it has taken over a year to fix obvious problems with regards to one of the few dedicated cycle lanes in Belfast at Alfred Street, and the Belfast Cycle Network Plan was finished consultation in 2017. So can I ask what specific actions the Minister is going to take to progress those particular matters? Um, Yes, um, I thank the member and I uh, recognise his passion on this. And yes, it was very informative going to the APG and I look forward to taking up their recent invitation to go to discuss some of this uh, and would be keen that the um, walking and cycling champion accompanies me to that. Um, what I've tasked the champion uh, with doing is pulling out what already exists. So you've referenced the Belfast Cycle Network and you've also referenced existing cycle routes that need to be improved. So there are things that would require some investment to improve an entire network. I think that has to be the approach, and that's certainly going to be the focus of the Ministerial Advisory Group and the Champion. And I am uh, adamant that I will be coming back very quickly to members to give them practical updates on what we are actually delivering on this project. Um, I think it's easy to talk uh, about these things, but you judge a person by what they actually do, and I'm very committed to delivering on this. Mr John O'Dowd. I thank the Minister for her answers thus far. I am slightly uh, surprised, if not disappointed, to learn that, given the, the furlough scheme was introduced on the 20th of March, that there has not been further and definitive investigations in her department, particularly in relation to TransLink workers. But can I ask the Minister uh, what preparations or what investigations has her department undertaken to reprofile budgets within her department, as <coughs> clearly there are prices on her budget and other executive budgets, but there will be business areas that will have stopped or eased or have spent less money than was predicted. So has the Minister started to reprofile her budget moving forward? Thank the member for his question. Uh, the Minister for Finance only raised the issue of furloughing with me, I think it was last week or, or towards the tail end of it, and I am very clear that it is a significant decision that we need to take uh, right across the executive. Um, on the issue of reprofiling, um, of course, we absolutely. I'm very clear. This is not a normal budgetary process. This is not a normal budgetary period. And where I can find easements and reprofiling, I absolutely will. The difficulty for my department is that we have seen a dramatic reduction in, in revenue through TransLink, through DVA, uh, and through Northern Ireland Water because we have brought in measures to try to support businesses. 
Um, that dramatic reduction in income sits alongside very high levels of static cost. Uh, so I can assure the member where we can try to be creative in the budget, um, we will continue to do so. I think the challenge for me, though, is that in the COVID-19 budget, as yet nothing has come across to the Department for Infrastructure. If I could get some certainty uh, around that in order to ease the financial pressures that I have, I think it would help to be able to identify where we have any flexibilities. Mr. Justin McNulty. And can I thank the Minister and the Department and her frontline workers for the exceptional work they have been doing to ensure that the wheels keep on turning to allow our society to keep functioning. I was astonished to learn, Minister, despite everything your Department is doing, that you received zero funding in the COVID budget allocation. Can I ask the Minister why did the Finance Minister, indeed the entire Executive, award COVID funding to all departments except yours? particularly given your department's pressures to maintain the key services such as public transport, safe roads and clean drinking water, which are fundamental not just to the COVID response but to our recovery on this island. What happens to all in this together? I thank the member for his question. Yes, um, to date there hasn't been an allocation uh, transferred across the Department for Infrastructure. Um, £95 million has been kept in the centre for a possible transport package. From that uh, has come the, the support for ferries. Uh, from that has come the support for uh, the airports. Um, and members will be aware of the issue facing TransLink alone. So the remainder of that pot of money isn't sufficient in order to meet those financial pressures. So that is a, a serious uh, concern. Um, I do welcome, however, the executive's commitment to fund uh, TransLink. They recognise that we need to have a publicly owned public transport network, not just for the economic and social benefits that it brings, but also in terms of um, tackling the climate emergency. So yes, it was disappointing, but I continue to engage with the Finance Minister, and I hope that very, very soon uh, I will be able to see an allocation come across to my department so that I can properly plan and prepare. Mrs Rosemary Barton. Thank you very much, Minister, for your answer so far. Um, I'm glad to see that you're looking at pathways and ways of improving exercise for people. In, rural, in the rural areas, we have many villages that have footpaths along the outskirts of the village and along main routes, etc. However, over the years, these have, been totally, have become totally neglected because of uh, budgetary pressures, and they tend to have been the last thing to be looked at. Many of them have grass growing through them. Some of them have what used to be lights along them, have been actually switched off, not used anymore. Can you give an assurance that now, with your new, th new thoughts, new, looking, new look at uh, these pathways for walking, taking exercise, that perhaps there will be a reassessment and uh, some of these footpaths made better again for people to take walk on? Uh, I thank the member for a question. The, the reality is that social distancing is going to be with us um, for a long time. Um, we need to be creating the space uh, for people to be able to socially distance and, and to keep safe. Um, I want, as I said, in terms of the, the work of the champion, to be linking in with a lot of the work that's already taken place. So I'm keen to have a discussion with uh, Minister Hargey, for example, on public realms works that her department is carrying out to see can we make the widening of footpaths a key element of that. I think that has to be the approach. The member is right in terms of how we've had to severely curtail uh, a number of services that the department provides. So grass cutting, for example, has been severely uh, curtailed back a number of services have because of budgetary pressures. We recognise the importance of these issues and we try to do what we can, but as always we have to operate within the financial constraints and that is as frustrating for me as it is, I'm sure, for you. Call Ms Rachel Woods. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for her statement today. I'm very happy to learn of the focus on a green recovery and in particular the reallocation of road space, which I and other Greens had called on her last time to support, and I thank you for your correspondence on that. Given the focus on walking and cycling, will the Minister commit to not progressing any further the experimental traffic control scheme permitted taxis and bus lanes, instead of focusing on other measures to enhance the provision of public transport, cycle infrastructure and pedestrian priority? 
Again, I thank the member for the question. Um, I think that what we need to do um, uh, is go up in the helicopter to take a holistic and comprehensive view of our public transport network. Um, I think that we need to look at the hierarchy and have uh, walkers uh, at the top. We have cyclists, riders, drivers, but we also have to recognise that if we have a really good public transport system, then that requires our buses, uh, our trains, but also our taxi drivers as well. I think they're an important uh, part of it. Um, so I recognise that. Uh, I suppose the challenge then is how you use the road space that we have to recognise that that is an integrated transport system, but at the same time be mindful of um, environmental improvements and benefits. So it is an issue that I'm aware of. I've been very much focused on COVID-19 at present, but I know that it is an issue and I had started to engage on it um, just before the crisis hit, and it's certainly an issue that I will engage on further. Mr. Jim Allister. The Minister, back to the haulage sector. Um, if the executive is considering a support package for that sector, would she deal with a rumour which has circulated within that sector over the weekend that the executive is minded to limit such a package to haulage companies with 90 or less lorries, which of course would be devastating? for an employer, a major employer, like McBurney Brothers, uh, McBurney Transport, in my constituency. Can she therefore give an assurance that any package will be open to all, will be fair and will be proportionate? I think that's always uh, the outcome that you seek to do achieve. I think the challenge here is that um, any financial package that's forthcoming that's going to be uh, funded by the British government to some extent or other requires sign off by Treasury. Um, I can assure you that we have not had discussions as an executive about limiting the financial support or the granular detail that you have spoken about. Um, so I was surprised to, to read some of the, that, that online over the weekend. Um, look, I'm very clear. The haulage industry has a critical role to play. The makeup of our haulage industry means that very many of those engaged in the service don't have huge reserves to be dipping in and out of, so they're at breaking point. Um, what we can continue to do and what we are doing is making those representations. As I say, I feel that we have successfully made the case to the Department for Transport. The situation now sits with UK Treasury, uh, and we will continue to press the case for them. We will continue to work with the haulage industry to provide the evidence that Treasury is seeking, and I'm hopeful that we can get to a position where we can see financial support going to our hauliers. Mr Cherry, Carol. Uh, thank you. The Minister said uh, she'd like to hear about any issues in relation to PPE and socially distancing, and I welcome her, her statement and her comment to that effect. Uh, workers in the road service in Belfast have been in contact uh, with my office uh, and brought serious concerns about non-essential work, uh, which road service staff in other regions are not being made to, to do to carry out during this crisis, and they've raised concern that they're unable to socially distance from the public while doing it, putting themselves and obviously the public uh, at risk. And worse, on top of that, the protection that they are given uh, does not prevent the spread of, of COVID-19, and when they are doing emergency work, they are not being given proper PPE uh, at all. And I've, I've written to the Minister's office um, about these issues, and the workers themselves have raised the issues, but seemingly nothing has been done in relation uh, to it. So I would just like to ask the Minister, uh, can she give a guarantee today that these workers will no longer be asked to carry out non-essential work and will be provided with adequate PPE when they have to do emergency work? I have to say to the member, I haven't seen your piece of correspondence, so I don't know whether you've just sent it in or not, but it certainly hasn't come up to me, so I'm not aware of the detail of the case. Um, the th it, it's clear that it needs to be essential work. I'm clear on that as a minister. I think sometimes the challenge is, and I know the constituents have said this to me, where they see uh, some of our staff like cleaning gullies and they can't understand why that would be deemed to be essential works. It's essential works because if we don't have a system of clearing of gullies, then we run the risk of flooding, so it's about the protection of homes. But what I will do is um, I will ask officials to provide me with your correspondence and I will get in touch directly with you on it. That concludes questions on the statement. I thank the Minister for coming to speak to the House. I have received notice from the Minister for Education, Mr Peter Weir, that he wishes to make a statement. Minister.